Howdy. I want to start by uh, thanking everyone in New Hampton for asking me to speak and, uh, and play tonight. And I want to thank you all for being here. So who the heck am I? Well, my name is Abel James Bascom, and I'm a New Hampton grad class of 2002. And believe it or not, as Mrs. Berry said, uh, Mr. Redmond was one of my teachers, my English teacher for, I believe, it was sophomore year. And he was young then. Uh, <laughs> He promised me that he would heckle me tonight, but he forgot that I have the microphone. <laughs> All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give a brief introduction, tell you about my experience at New Hampton, play a few tunes so you don't completely get bored to tears, talk about my life after New Hampton, and leave you with some words of wisdom, and I'll use that term loosely. Hopefully we'll have some time uh, at the end for you to ask me some questions as well. So. Just as a quick note, PowerPoints tend to distract and bore me. So I'm going to add, I'm going to do this old school and just use the slideshow uh, right next to me here to add some visual interest and read my notes uh, to keep myself on track because who knows what I'll talk about if I don't. So let's start with a hint of what I'm up to now. <laughs> some people call me a musician, an author, a consultant, or an entrepreneur, but most people just skip all of that and call me crazy. And you'll quickly learn that I'm not a normal guy and I don't tend to color within the lines. And that's probably why they asked me to speak tonight. As a matter of fact, I actually spend most of my time doing unconventional things that most people consider unwise. So I'm going to walk you through my descent into madness. As you may have gathered from the guitar over there, I'm a professional musician. I write my own tunes, sing, gig with a few groups, and also have a few albums. Last year I went on tour and completely burned myself out playing over 250 shows and in one day even four. And it was all across North America. I'm being a bit easier on myself this year and focusing more on writing and recording. <laughs> I have a blog and an online radio show called The Fat Burning Man that's been catching on recently. And I teach interested folks about the benefits of eating like a caveman, how to get ripped with as little exercise as possible, and talk with guests who are either brilliant, ahead of their time, and cutting edge in their respective fields, or complete quacks who threaten the sanity of the world at large. And this all depends on your point of view. I recently finished a couple of books, and I have a few albums as well. The first is called The Lean Body Lifestyle Details and Approach to Optimizing Health and Fitness Through Evolutionary Biology. The second is more of a mini book where I do a brief review of academic literature called The Musical Brain. Now music is everywhere. I explore why from an evolutionary perspective that's the case. And if you've ever met a musician, it's clear that we're a unique bunch. I explain how the brain of the musician is distinct from that of the non-musician and uh, try to clear up a bit of that quirkiness. I live in Austin, Texas with my awesome girlfriend named Allison. She's, you guys will probably appreciate this. She's a former professional gamer specializing in Halo and just helped release the new Star Wars game, The Old Republic. I actually have an, uh, an extra copy of that, so if anyone is interested, you can come up to me after. We just started a t-shirt company and we're launching our own line of silly t-shirts with clubs on them and, and little dinosaurs. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's a little puppy on a leash in a epic photo bomb, completely losing her mind. And I, I love that picture. <laughs> so I have a manic lab puppy named Bailey who's intent on completely destroying my life. Last week, she literally started eating the siding off of my house. <laughs> and that's totally not Photoshop, by the way. Now, I don't really have time to delve into all of these things right now, but I will save some time for questions at the end. But first, let's talk about my days in New Hampton. So I was a day student, and I grew up about 20 minutes away in the teeny little town of Center Harbor, New Hampshire. When I first came to New Hampton, I was just a little freshman, and I joined the football team. As you can probably gather, I was not on the offensive line. Truth be told, my right shoulder still bugs me from being constantly crushed from guys who were way bigger and stronger than I was. So when I learned that there was a possibility of moving up in some of my classes and skipping a grade to be an instant sophomore, I did it quick to avoid being thrown in the pond by the upperclassmen. Now, I'm not sure if you guys still do that, 
but hopefully I'm, I'm safe now because I think I have seniority. And so I spent a lot of my time um, during lunch breaks while I was here. Instead of eating lunch, I would go and jam with one of the Spanish teachers in the music department playing Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, and Bob Marley. I, uh, I played basketball poorly and I ran cross country. I studied Latin, I enjoyed English, and even accidentally was cast the lead of a musical. And this segues into one of the themes I'll be talking about tonight, which is taking on immense challenges and then doing things that are seemingly impossible. And I'm going to share with you a quick story that I wrote with my buddy Will McDonough my senior year about the musical Merrily We Roll Along. It's some of the, the teachers now, actually, who were students might remember that, and certainly some of the teachers who are still here do as well. And you may also remember that Merrily We Roll Along was doomed before it started. I didn't have time personally for memorizing hundreds of pages of music and lines, and the thought of singing, dancing, <laughs> and acting was completely and utterly terrifying. Now Will, the guy on the left in that picture, and I simply didn't want to do it, but the Cavalier director, Mr. Cheney, who's actually here tonight, who some of you may know, somehow convinced us, and the whole community magically came together to make it happen. So I'm going to read you a little piece of what Will and I wrote for the Alumni Parent magazine about 10 years ago. Dude, this is not happening, Will muttered as he thumbed through the script. Abel stared blankly, his gargantuan binder full of songs, notes, lyrics, and lines, looking as if he had just ingested three gallons of liquid plumber. We were exhausted, angry, and frustrated, and we hadn't even started yet. You see, we had never been expected to memorize thousands of lines, learn the lyrics and music to cover over a dozen songs, and learn to act, sing, and dance in a period of less than two months. That makes sense, though, considering neither of us had ever been in a musical, and now we both had lead roles. So we decided to do a little research and soon discovered that Merrily We Roll Along had been a complete failure on Broadway, lasting over 16 performances, making it the second worst running play <laughs> ever composed by the legendary Stephen Sondheim. In addition, our director, Matthew Cheney, wrote, I don't think we have ever tried to do such a difficult show at New Hampton. The music alone is enough to turn any sane high school director off. So saying that the, the play was hard work is an understatement. In addition to a rigorous academic schedule, the lead actors and actresses listened listen to the soundtrack of the morning, ran lines at breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a thing called school and athletics in between, and researched as much as six hours a night, rehearsed as much as six hours a night, followed by a few hours of homework and usually a lesser amount of sleep. Upon completion of the rehearsal process, each lead character had committed nearly 200 hours to production. And then, in three short days, we were done. And to everyone's surprise, the play had been a huge success. In spite of our impossible situation, and in spite of ourselves, a play that was a complete failure on Broadway, a director who admitted that he should have never been a director of musicals, <laughs> leads in a cast who had little interest, no time, and no experience, merely, and I'm quoting the director here, was an unqualified success and one of the greatest moments in New Hampton School Theater history. I sat in the audience each night and watched miracles happen all over the stage. So what did we learn? Well, that combined with an immense amount of hard work, taking a long shot is worth it. And personally, if I hadn't tried something that had made me completely uncomfortable, faced my fears, and set aside my better judgment, there's no way that I'd be a musician today. And you know, a little more than 10 years ago, the first time I ever sang in front of people was on this very stage. I had bangs, I played a Jimi Hendrix song with a sweater vest on, and it was terrifying. I'm not kidding, it was profoundly disturbing. And on that note, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed and I'm gonna play a few tunes for you in just a second. And so people ask me if I'm nervous when I'm playing in front of people. And even after playing thousands of shows all across the world, the answer is an unmitigated yes. But over time, you channel your nervousness into energy. And it's like that with life, too. Every time you conquer your fear and you do something that scares you, you get stronger. So anyway, I'm going to play you some tunes. I use music and writing as a bit of a confessional. 
and each little tune that I'm going to play for you is a little nugget of my life. Check one, two. And you know, Mr. Redman, you can come up here and sing some Crosby, Stills, and Nash with me if you'd like. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard him much, but he rocks. Him and Ted Styles. I'm actually, actually Ted. He played. Um, I think it was Rock in the Free World, wasn't it? That was a pretty awesome jam back in the day. <laughs> Have you guys seen that yet? If not, you should definitely ask him for it. How are you guys in the booth? Is it guitar right? I'm going to start out with a little tune called Voodoo Queen. I sell bedroom with the voodoo queen. This cold sweat is clean to my bones. And she's like a tigress, and I'm trembling. The sun says she's just shopping in her claws. Sometimes I wonder, is she what I need? Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to laugh about magic, but now I do believe. In the morning, when all my eyes were red, my body wakes up, bruised them bold. But you can't pretend I can't do a thing. When she's stubborn, God, that which is bold. She's begging for my company. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to laugh that magic. Now I do believe. Shopping in the clouds. Sometimes I wonder, is she what I need? Yeah, yeah. When I used to laugh at magic, now I do. I used to laugh at magic, now I do. I used to laugh at magic, now I do believe. Thank you so very much. The mind is a little wonky, the guitar's cutting in and out, but we can make do. This is a newer one called Don't Wait for the Morning. It's about the perils of single life. I fly on the ceiling, twitching above our heads. Sitting on two lonely bodies in a big old lonely bed. We're both still dreaming, heavy as the night is long. And lean over to kiss her if it didn't feel so wrong. But she said, if you don't wait for the morning, if you don't stay with me. Put away for the morning child, we don't bother me. Feel away for the morning, we don't bother me. She was 
just as tempted as coffee left on the pot. And now I'm not much for drinking, sometimes you just need a shot. So I search for my jeans, pull up my wallet and for my keys. Slowly turns to me and says, shut the door behind you if you please. She said, if you were up for the morning, if you don't stay with me, if you were away for the morning, child, it don't bother me. If you were away for the morning, it don't bother me. So I stepped out the back door, straight into the night. And how dogs are howling in the smoky moonlight. I should feel you just walking around about two foot tall. Baby, I don't feel nothing at all, nothing at all. Cause I don't love you, baby. I don't care. Don't cost me no concern If you never see you nowhere She said, if you don't wait for the morning If you don't stay with me If you don't wait for the morning, child It don't bother me If you don't wait for the morning It don't bother me If you don't wait for the morning If you don't stay with me Away for the morning, child, it don't bother me. No. Feel away for the morning, it don't bother. Feel away for the morning, it don't bother. Feel away for the morning, it don't bother me. Thank you so very much. I'm going to continue on that theme. I wrote this song about some creepy dude sitting in the back of a bar that I was playing in Austin, Texas. See if you can read between the lines. Oh, you know, I never dreamed of gold. There's a shadow on my soul. I wait for the final call, you know, when my dad will be rolled. I try to be a better man, but I drag these old bones through the sand. It's the beating of my wings, too much for you to stand. Cause I'm a vulture in the night. Got a healthy appetite Well, well, well I'm looking straight at you So darling, how do you do? And every night I do the same Sparking out your names And I use all the classic lines All the scraps left behind so I sneak up by your side Well, I still got my pride Though you swat and be left and right Well, I'll be pecking at the eye Cause I'm a vulture in the night Where's your heart out of sight? Well, 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 I'm looking straight at you so baby, how could I refuse you? When you're dancing around your shoes, baby You know you take me to paradise And I will have it just in one of you ladies But so, it sure be nice Cause I'm a vulture in the night And I got a healthy appetite Well, well, well Looking straight at you So darling, how could I refuse you? Said I'm a vulture in the night I made your out of sight Well, well, well I'm looking straight at you So darling, how do you do? 
Cause I got nothing left to lose Thank you so much. This is next one. It's kind of a coffee shop tune. I wrote it in my teeny little 400 square foot apartment that I shared with my girlfriend in Washington, D.C. that had baby rats running around. About a day that really was completely unremarkable, and that's what made it perfect. Sultry steaming sound. We're still feeling so slow. The full sunshine bounces all around as we read the New York Times. Like we care what's going on outside. Just don't know why I'm playing. Sing you smile as you wake up on words you don't know. Oh, you're that smile. So I pull it close and I sway you soft and slow. And on this day is a Sunday. It's not real good, but it's so long gone down. The neighbors hear us laughing because my shirt is covered in hash browns, sweet thoughts, kisses, and red wine. We kept us up all night once again. Don't know why plays on the radio We both sing along You smile as you make up all the words you don't know Oh, love that smile So pull it close and I sway you soft and slow
Thanks so much. Hey, darling. What's your name? What's your sign? Can I get your number for show you a time? When I see your face, I can't concentrate. Cause I'm thinking about all the crazy love, babe. And I got this premonition now, baby, with a kiss of that girl, you make me see. And I got this intuition that there's something you've been missing, and I think it might be me. So, darling, can I get you with my song? Yeah, we're playing all night long, and I said, darling. Can I get with my song? Yeah, you guys rock out. I appreciate that. And I saw you giving me the eye. And I know I'm satisfied I said, darling Can I get you with my song? Yeah, I'm playing all night long And I said, darling Can I get you with my song? Yeah, 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 yeah From the plants in my direction Is how you giving me the eye? A little introspection while you'll see I'll satisfy Cause I could be sentimental If you just give me a chance I'll squeeze your piece of down on the my homegrown romance So darling Can I get you with my song? Yeah, we're playing all night long And I said darling Can I get you with my song? I'll give you Oh, a sexy seven name Well, well, well Hey, darling Well, you're gonna be so glad I play So, darling Can I get you with my song? Yeah, we're playing all night long And I said, darling can I get you with my song? Cause it's gonna rock you all night long. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was fun. I got time for about one more because this is just a little brief set and I can't keep you here all night. But the next one I'm gonna play kind of leads into what I'll be talking about next which is how I got into this crazy, crazy life that I'm leading and uh, kind of what happened along the way. This one's called Live While I'm Alive. When you see that beauty over there, you're gonna make her mine. Give her everything I got Cause I ain't worth a dime I said, no, you won't I said, no, you won't Kid, you must have lost your mind You must have lost your mind I said, I don't want this job no more I'm gonna play guitar all day Make my living in smoky bars Rocking my booze away They said, oh, no, you don't Oh, no, you don't Ooh, Son, you must have lost your mind Oh, yeah But I'm gonna live while I'm alive Ain't nobody ever gonna change my mind Oh, no So I said, bye-bye, baby Bye-bye, baby, I'm gone Yeah, I'm gone I said, bye-bye, baby You know I got my walking shoes on Yeah I just found a ride for me It's 85 Mercedes Benz 
I know she needs some TLC, but she's found herself a friend that said, I know you want, I know you want. Man, you must have lost your mind. You must have lost your mind. But I'm going to live out loud I'm alive. Ain't nobody ever going to change my mind. Oh, no. So I said, bye, bye, baby. Bye, bye, baby, I'm gone Yeah, I'm gone I said, bye, bye, baby You know I got my walking shoes on So, so hard I'm gonna drive across the country Gonna have myself a time my girl and my guitar, dry little bands into the night. They said, well, no, you won't. No, 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 you won't. Man, you must have lost your mind. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to live out loud I'm alive. Ain't nobody ever going to change my mind. Oh, no. So I said, bye, bye, baby. Bye-bye, baby, I'm gone Yeah, I'm gone I said, bye-bye, baby You know I got my walking shoes on So, so long Cause I'm gonna live out loud I'm alive Ain't nobody ever gonna live out loud I'm alive Ain't nobody ever gonna live a long life Ain't nobody ever I said ain't nobody ever Gonna change my mind Thanks so very much all right, I'm going back over to that mic now. Hey! So that was fun, huh? That's the life of a consultant. Just kidding, it's not. All right, so what happened after New Hampton? <laughs> That's not after New Hampton. Uh, well, I, I uh, drove down the road to Hanover, New Hampshire, and I majored in psychological and brain sciences at Dartmouth. And suffice it to say, I worked incredibly hard, finished my degree early again, and had enormous amounts of fun. I was a brother at SIGEP. I played in bands, and I directed the Dartmouth Airs, who some of you may know after being on NBC last season for the sing-off. And I had to take on some pretty hefty loans, so I spent the lion's share of my senior fall dressed in a suit interviewing for corporate jobs in hopes of paying them off as quickly as I could. Given my background and the fact that everyone I was interviewing against was specializing in finance, economics, engineering, or mathematics, getting a corporate gig wasn't a cakewalk. Actually, in one interview, one of the executives looked at my resume and remarked, you majored in psychological and brain sciences. I said, yes, sir. He looked me square in the eye and said, then why are you here? It was a, a, <laughs> it was a completely uncomfortable situation. I think you'll see that there's a pattern here. I'm in those a lot. But anyway, I landed a job as a strategy consultant in Washington, DC. And if you guys don't know what a consultant is, uh, you know Bob and Bob from the office space, from office space? They um, basically come in wearing suits and fire everyone at sight. They're right there. They're consultants. That's not exactly what I did. But I did have a somewhat weird job. It was, it was fascinating, but it didn't really nurture my soul or creativity in the way that, I, that I'd want in a job or in a life's calling. But that's fine, because I was there to pay off my loans. So I worked hard, and people took notice. I was on the fast track, as they say, wearing suits and shaking hands. I was promoted quickly, won bonuses and awards, and was promised to be vice president by 26. And then I quit. To everyone's astonishment, my bosses, my coworkers, my friends, my girlfriend's parents, probably my parents, even though they didn't tell me so, 
Everyone was horrified, and they thought I was freaking nuts. But you see, after working my butt off for years, graduating early, taking freelance jobs in computer programming, and gigging every weekend to pay off my loans, I was fried. The way I saw it, I owed it to myself to goof off for a while, to actually see the world and not be cooped up in some stuffy little office in DC for the rest of my sorry days. What kind of life is that anyway? So I gleefully quit my job, wrote a huge check to pay off my loans, which effectively emptied my bank account. But not before. I bought a 1985 Mercedes 300 diesel, filled up the tank with converted vegetable oil, and drove it across the country. That's what that song was about. And that's right, old diesels do run on vegetable oil, and it smells like fried chicken. Just ask Ted Stiles. <laughs> so I goofed off for a few months. I toured national parks, hung out with old friends across the country, including my buddy Will, who was up there earlier. I found a new home in Austin, Texas. I had a blast. And everyone in this room owes it to themselves to do something just like that. We live in an amazing and a beautiful country, and you should really go see it. So then of all places, I moved to Texas with no prospects, no connections, and no friends. And once again, everyone thought I was bananas and told me so. But the music, the people, the outdoors, and the fun of Austin just sucked me in. And at first, everything was just dandy in the land of 10-gallon hats and tumbleweeds. Then, several months later, a fire destroyed everything that I had. My books, my clothes, my recordings, my instruments, my computers, and even their backed up hard drives. Everything. I came home one night and a 30-foot wall of flames had engulfed everything. Crap. After cleaning out my bank account to pay off my loans, I was broke. The fire left me withered and exhausted, and all my friends and family were thousands of miles away. So after spending the vast majority of my life making unconventional decisions and doing things that sensible people say shouldn't be done, I was ready to accept that I finally was crazy. I couldn't sleep. I started getting sick all the time, gained weight, and generally felt miserable. After losing it all, I felt like my life was completely out of my control. But then I realized that if there is one thing I can control, it's my body and my health. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about one of the principal reasons I decided to devote a large part of my life to help other people take their own health into their own hands. So when I worked in private sector consulting, we advised Fortune 500, Fortune 100, and international companies. Basically, what we did is we took their processes, analyzed them, and made them more efficient. This meant improving things like technology, supply chain marketing, and ultimately reducing costs and increasing sales. All pretty boring stuff if you're in high school, or if you're out of high school, for that matter. <laughs> so some of the companies we worked with were food manufacturers. And this was really my first taste of how the sausage is made, so to speak. One day I sat down with some of my clients at a, uh, a coffee creamer substitute company, and I'm contractually obligated not to disclose the name, so you'll just have to guess. <laughs> I was making small talk with some of the executives, and I asked them, so what's your favorite flavor of this coffee creamer? You know, Irish cream, vanilla, pumpkin pie? And they said, ugh, Abel, we don't touch this stuff. It's all chemicals. And I was stunned. I just sat there looking at them speechless because the whole point of this meeting was to figure out how to sell this stuff. They call poison to more people in America. And needless to say, that turned a light on for me. So I thought, what else are these vultures lying about? So I read hundreds of books, and I sifted through all of the nonsense and misinformation masquerading as fact to find the truth behind optimized nutrition, fitness, and health. Then I relentlessly guinea-pigged on myself to see what worked and what didn't. I discovered that the vast majority of conventional wisdom about health is completely back asswards. It wasn't until I completely abandoned everything I thought was the truth that I was able to make progress. I learned that growing my own kale, 
chowing down on local porterhouse steaks and grass-fed livers. Sorry for Meatless Monday. I know that's a <laughs> this is poor timing. <laughs> but even eating pastured butter by the stick, and I'm not kidding, I've done that, is, hearth he <laughs> is healthier for the heart than heart-healthy whole grains. So when I put this into practice, I lost 20 pounds in 40 days and put on 10 pounds of lean muscle with just minutes of exercise a week. This is after being sick. And this is by doing precisely the opposite of what all of the experts, experts tell you to do. And so even though I have no degree in nutrition, I'm not a medical doctor, and I have no real qualifications, I wrote a book to help spread the word that eating the standard American high carb, low fat diet is a monumental mistake. I provide a very simple solution. In short, eat real food that humans are biologically designed to eat. Plenty of wild vegetables, fruits, and some animals. <laughs> so that brings me to today. Bailey eats kale too. I have several cool and completely unconventional jobs, and it's difficult for me to differentiate between work and play. I rock out from time to time. I'm living the American dream with a cute house and a wonderful little neighborhood in South Central Austin with my awesome girlfriend and terrible puppy. I eat a great deal of chocolate. I enjoy hand-rolled scars, and I spend my mornings drinking far too much coffee and nights drinking far too much Pinot Noir. But let's be very clear. None of this would have been possible if I hadn't been willing to suck it up trust my heart and passions, and do crazy, unpredictable things that terrified the sensible and usually well-meaning naysayers who were shaking their fingers at every turn. If I hadn't had a strong stomach and thick skin, I never would have been able to do the impossible. With nearly every life decision to get me to this point, someone has told me that I've completely lost my mind. I've been sabotaged and ridiculed, often publicly. According to the world, these were very unpopular dreams and decisions. The list goes on. People said I'd never make it to the Ivy League. I almost had to drop out my sophomore year because they increased tuition and we couldn't cover it or find another loan. With absolutely no training or singing in choir, I shouldn't have made it into, let alone be elected director of the Dartmouth Airs, one of the best vocal groups in the nation. I wasn't qualified to get a job as a strategy consultant. It was completely bonkers to quit a promising corporate job to drive across the country in a 25-year-old car running on spent friolator oil with no job and no prospects. I wasn't supposed to write a book about nutrition with absolutely no qualifications. But when you take enormous risks, you follow your passions and you work extraordinarily hard, magic happens. And the decisions that have terrified me the most, when everyone called me crazy or tried to tear me down, those are the ones that have been by far the most rewarding in my life. And here's another little secret that I want to tell you guys. I never should have been able to attend New Hampton School. Worse than having no money, my parents were deeply in debt and I was told that going to private school was simply not in the cards for a variety of reasons. And sipping wine with my dad last night, he reminisced about what happened next. He said it was the most impossible thing I'd ever seen. This determined little 14-year-old had an impossible dream and refused to give up. It wasn't even an impossible dream at first. It was just some wacko idea. We hit roadblock after roadblock, and for months, it seemed like this could never work. And then something incredible happened. People saw the fire in his eyes. They sensed the passion, and people started rallying around him and helping him to achieve his dream in whatever way they could. Even if he never could have gone to New Hampton, watching all of this unfold changed, changed my life. My parents, the music teachers, the drama department, the English department, financial aid, admissions, my boss at work who pretended that I was 18 to give me extra hours, everyone stepped in to help make the impossible happen. And needless to say, after many struggles and with massive amounts of support from people who stepped in to help, I made it here. But that's not even the point. When you follow your passions, work incredibly hard, and truly walk the walk, even if you do not succeed, you inspire others along the way. And I'm not sure if this is still New Hampton's slogan, but when I was here, it was in a world that expects you to fit in, we teach you to stand out. And quite honestly, when I sat in those seats as a student here, I thought it was cheesy nonsense. But there's a great deal of wisdom 
in that cliche. In high school, it's all about how do I fit in, isn't it? But in business, in life later on, and certainly in dating, it's all about how do I stand out? <laughs> in the end, being like everyone else is no fun at all. And you'll never do impossible things. Standing out has its benefits. So believe it or not, I'm shy by nature. I used to be terrified of straying from the norm. And now I don't consider my day complete until someone has called me crazy. In conclusion, you students live in an age of enormous opportunity. You can practically get your PhD with Google on your iPhone these days. You can start a business from nothing. You can be an independent artist. You can travel the world and discover your passions. And there's no better time to find what you love and do exactly that. I think the best advice that I could ever give is to stop worrying about what other people think. Lead them. Their reluctance and inertia will soon turn into momentum. Forget about what everyone else wants you to be and ask yourself right now, what is your passion? Who do you want to be? I'll wrap up with one of my favorite quotes from the late Steve Jobs, who said, it's more fun to be a pirate than to join the Navy. So stop trying to do what everyone else is doing. Be unconventional and do the impossible instead. And let the naysayers call you nuts. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Nice. So we have a, uh, a, in the spirit of unconventional, we have a very unconventional gift for, uh, for Abel James. I don't know if this is going to come in handy uh, for him in a, if you haven't, how many of you have been to Austin, Texas? You got a couple of right. hands up. So I don't know if he's going to get a lot of mileage out of the great Husky <laughs> Nation tie, but we present this to uh, Abel James and, and a hearty thanks for a terrific talk tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. We'll put That's it back really in nice. We'll see if we get any mileage out of it. There's an opportunity for some questions if folks uh, have those. If we could turn the house lights up, that would be probably helpful uh, as well. Questions, comments? I see a hand right there. That's a really good question. The thing with music is that it's a community. Every single time that I've made any sort of stride forward, it hasn't been from competing against other musicians. It's asking them to play with me or playing with them. It's an attitude of generosity. You know, the way that you get gigs is by knowing people and having them like you. It's not by you know, sending off CDs and your resume everywhere because they get hundreds of those. I've tried that, it doesn't work. But if you're sitting in a coffee shop and you hear someone talking about music and they mention a band that you really like, be like, you know what, I like that band too. And who knows, that could be your next bass player. So it's, it's really that attitude of community, I think, is, is how you can get ahead, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. What is your current job right now? <laughs> <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask that. <laughs> I have a few, as you could probably imagine. Uh, I still have a job as a, uh, a consultant, although it's in a different capacity. Now I work with the federal government, principally the Department of Education, um, doing best practices research, which basically means managing um, big research projects that look at how to improve schools. Uh, is, is a good example of that. Now, I work from home, and that's with a, a small shop of ragtag consultants um, who called me up years ago with also with no prospects or anything like that. And now it's like a multi-million dollar company. Um, and I was like number four there. So I'm, I'm still doing that part-time slash full-time. And then I'm writing books and doing the nutrition stuff. My, my podcast has been taking off recently, so I'm doing more of that and I have a few other offers. And then obviously there's music in there too. So I don't really know what I do. But like I said, it's, it's hard to differentiate between work and play. 
And uh, <laughs> some of the worst advice I ever got was from uh, an anonymous person who said that work should be hard and you should hate it. That's why they pay you. I, I do the complete opposite of that and it's working out just fine. Yes, sir. <laughs> Tom Waits is a big one. Uh, I, I really liked Eric Clapton a lot. When I was, when I was your age, I guess, I was um, playing a lot of 90s music, so Nirvana. And uh, actually, I was just talking with Matt Cheney about Radiohead. They're one of my favorites, too. And then some of these people are still around, some of them aren't. I, uh, I studied jazz in London when I was at Dartmouth, and I, I really enjoyed that. John Schofield and uh, Coltrane. Uh, are, are huge influences, whether you can hear it or not. And then, of course, there are people like um, Johnny Cash, <laughs> who definitely have an influence over using your voice in its own unique way. And so I try to do that. Uh, how did your, your house act burn down? <laughs> 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 Going straight for the gullet right there. <laughs> well, they say it was, I actually lived in an apartment complex right on, um, strangely, a river of a gigantic body of water. And they said that the, the person who lived next door left a cigarette out. I don't know if that's true or not or how they could ever tell, but the place was gone when I came back and I did know that. But it all worked out. Good time for one more. Yeah, that was a high. <laughs> I love that question. For me, getting through it, well, music always helps. That was, uh, I was just telling someone today that the only way I could release my emotions when I was uh, actually at New Hampton when I, was, when I was younger and a younger teen was to shut myself into my room, crank up my electric guitar and just play as loudly as I could and as furiously as I could until I cried and just broke down. That was the only way that I could do it. So music has always been like this uh, emotional release for me. So if you can find a passion in art, that always seems to help. And then for me, being a complete type A, having something to divert my attention, like, uh, like after the fire, focusing on my health and trying to, to master that and really understand that as a field, uh, definitely help. You just have to keep moving forward. If I wallowed about all of the songs that I lost and all the recordings and instruments, then it would be hard to get back up. But if you start writing new ones, and if you start having many things to look forward to, then, then it's, uh, it's not easy to go forward, but it makes you stronger, and you always come out better off than you came in. Well, let's thank uh, Abel James again. Thank you very, very much. We'll stay around for a minute. Yeah,